I would like to go through this PowerPoint and just sort of point out some things that maybe aren't obvious and maybe add a few things to it that aren't in it just to sort of help you reinforce the ideas that it's presenting. I don't want to go through it line by line. You can read it on your own. In fact, you should download it, print it out, read through it before you watch this video and make a real effort to try to understand all the things that are presented. And uh, so now I'm going to just go through and just point out a few things to sort of reinforce those ideas and help uh, them sink in. Now this is a lab-based course, and you probably know this already, but labs are all about making measurements. And measurements are the very basis of scientific investigations. We observe things in nature, we want to understand them, and so the way that we understand them is by conducting experiments and measuring things about them. We do this because we have this fundamental assumption that the universe is orderly and it can be understood. Now the question arises, what is it that makes something scientific? What is it that makes a particular belief a scientific belief instead of, say, a religious belief, which might be based on faith, or a philosophical belief, which might be based on pure logic? Uh, what is it that makes something a scientific belief? And the answer to that is scientific beliefs are developed through a process known as the scientific method. Now, if you get 10 different science books, 10 different introductory science books, and you turn to the section on the scientific method, you might find 10 completely different explanations of the steps. You know, they might be in slightly different orders. Some books might include a few steps that other books omit. But the basic ideas are always going to be there. And of those ideas, the most important is experimentation. We want to experiment. Experimentation is all about testing what we think. We make observations, we form hypotheses, and we test those hypotheses with experiment. Then by analyzing the results of those experiments, we can make conclusions and come up with theories and models that explain what we observe. And typically, scientists will cycle through this process multiple times and refine their theories and make them stronger and better. Now, as we continue going through, we'll note that there's two different kinds of data. There are quantitative data, which are data that have numbers attached to them, and there are also qualitative data. Qualitative data are the kinds of data that describe the qualities that things possess. So, for example, you might look at the light coming from a star far away, and you might say that that light looks kind of reddish. It has a red color. That would be a quality of the light, and so that would be a qualitative measurement. Now, if you measured that the wavelength of the light was 750 nanometers, well, that's a number. It's something that you can associate with that light that puts a quantity to it. And when you can, in science, you always want to make quantitative numbers, quantitative measurements, because those kinds of measurements can be directly compared. You can say that 750 is bigger than 650 or whatever. Now, when you make a hypothesis, one of the key things that you want to focus on is the idea that a hypothesis must be testable. Remember, if you can't test your hypothesis, it's not science. Being able to conduct an experiment, being able to perform a test, that is what makes something a scientific belief or a scientific idea. So here we see some examples of different hypotheses uh, labeled as good and bad. Let's just take the first of each of these. So the first good hypothesis was plants will grow taller when given miracle grow. Uh, then down below we see an example as a bad hypothesis Plants will grow better when given miracle grow. The reason that that's a bad hypothesis is because it's not clear what you mean by better. You might mean grow taller. You might mean bear more fruit. You might mean be more attractive. But whatever the case may be, it's not really defined very well. So a good hypothesis is going to be very specific about what you can measure. Now, for performing experiments, 
again, you see this idea of testing right here. Testing is everywhere in science. It has to be testable. And another idea is that you want to have duplication. You want to be able to duplicate your results by other scientists. And uh, that's a really important concept. Things have to be reproducible in science. If you do an experiment and you get an answer, and then you do the experiment again and you get a completely different answer, you do it again and you get a third completely different answer, then your experiment's not very good. But if you can do an experiment and get the same answer time after time, that's going to be very reassuring that you have a well-designed experiment. So what exactly is an experiment? It's a planned procedure that is designed to test your hypothesis. And typically you want a controlled experiment uh, where you have a control group and an experimental group. A classic example of this would be a drug trial, where maybe you want to test some new blood pressure drug. So you might give the drug to a group of people, uh, and then to another group of people, you might give a sugar pill that should not have any effect on their blood pressure, and then you see what the results are. And if the group that gets the pill for blood pressure has their blood pressure go down, and the other group, which thinks they're getting the same pill, but are really getting a placebo pill, a fake pill, their blood pressure doesn't go down, then that suggests that under that experiment that that drug really does have the effect that was desired. So that's what we mean by a control group. It's uh, something that we can test to see whether or not what we're looking for really is having the effect. Now what this slide is pointing out is that when you do an experiment, you only want to change one thing at a time. If you change multiple things and then you have some effect, you won't know which of the things you changed caused the effect. But if you change only one thing and you get some result from that change, then you know that it was likely the result of what you changed. So we can uh, label these kinds of things. We say that an independent variable, that's the thing that you change. So that's the one thing that you're changing in your experiment, and then you look and see what the results of that change are. And so you have the one thing that you're controlling, the one thing that you're changing, that's the independent variable, and then anything else that changes as a result of that is a dependent variable. So for example, we might add miracle Grow to our plant, it might grow taller, it might bear more fruit, it might be more attractive, etc. Those would be the dependent variables that you could test. Now once we have our data collected, we can uh, present that data to organize it so that we can understand it and also so that we can communicate our results to other people. Tables and graphs are very common ways that scientists use to present data. Here's an example of a data of a sorry this here's an example of a table which is showing data that is perhaps the height of a plant that has been given miracle grow plant A and the height of a plant that has not been given miracle grow plant B and so that could be say the height in centimeters and you can see that those heights were measured at different dates and so that would be one way of presenting that data here we see another way that that data can be presented. Here we see the data laid out on a graph where the vertical axis shows us the height and the horizontal axis shows us the time. Uh, it should probably, properly be labeled time in days or something like that, but we'll uh, ignore that for now. But anyway, the point is that this is simply another way to present data. Sadly, this is not the conclusion of the PowerPoint, but it's a slide talking about how you consider the conclusions of your experiment. You look at the data, and then you uh, determine whether your hypothesis was confirmed or refuted, and uh, that enables you to proceed further with more experiments or repeating the experiment or wherever you would normally go from there. Here we see an explanation of theory. So once you've accumulated a lot of data from different experiments and you have tested your hypothesis, you can form theories about the causes that, you are, that are causing the results that you are seeing. So an example of a theory is the atomic theory. That's the theory that materials are made up out of atoms. 
Now, this theory has been tested over and over again for hundreds of years, and there are many, many, many different experiments which show that matter is made up of atoms. So we are very confident of that result. However, if there were some experiments done in the future that showed that our conclusions were wrong, if there were some experiments done in the future that showed that atoms didn't really exist or they weren't what we thought they were, then we would have to change because of this new evidence. You know, if, if it were proven beyond a shadow of a doubt, what else can you do but change your theory? And this happens all the time in science. Theories are developed, and then they are extended, and they are shown to be wrong or to break down somewhere, and then the theory has to be revised and improved, and it gets better and better over time. And that's actually a feature of science. It's not something that's a bad thing. As we go on and on through the scientific world, over time we accumulate more information and our theories become better and stronger and we become more confident that they are corresponding to the world we live in. Now here we see uh, sort of a flow chart showing the scientific method and um, I would note just that you know, you might want to think of this more as a cycle, and you don't actually have to start at a particular step. You might start with an observation, or you might start with a hypothesis, or you might start with a theory that someone else has developed. And so uh, you could start at any point, and then you just sort of cycle through step by step. And of course, sometimes you might even do the steps a little bit out of order. It doesn't really matter. But if you're doing real science, all of these elements of the scientific method are going to be there. Okay, here we have uh, everyday scientific thinking. The sound from a CD and a CD player skips. So let's say we've made that observation. We've seen that we put a CD in our player and the CD skips. So we want to know what's wrong, what's causing it to skip. So we might form a couple of different hypotheses. We might have a hypothesis that the CD player is faulty, or we might have a hypothesis that the CD itself has some sort of damage to it. And so what we want to do is we want to test our different hypotheses. So for our first hypothesis that the CD player is faulty, uh, we could check and see what happens when you replace the CD with another one. That is, you're testing the player. So if you put the CD that skipped away and you put a new CD in the player and the new CD plays okay, that suggests that the player is not what is at fault. So that would be our first experiment. Then to test our second hypothesis that it's the CD is damaged, we could take the CD and try to play it in a separate player. And if it still skips, then that would be very strong evidence that it is the CD that is damaged. So here we have uh, a learning check. So you should go through each of these, A, B, C, and D, and determine whether that statement is a hypothesis, an observation, etc. And so let's look at point A. A blender does not work when plugged in. Is that a theory? Is that a hypothesis? Is it an observation? Is it an experiment? Well, really, you're observing that the blender does not work, so we would label that as one. And we would say that's a 1. And then we could look at the rest of these. And I'll let you go through that on your own. Uh, and don't look at the next slide in the PowerPoint because that has the answers. Really try to do it yourself uh, before you go on and then check and see whether you got the answers correct. So now you've gone through the PowerPoint. Uh, you can go on to the next part of the module and go through the procedure for the experiment. Good luck, and I will see you in the discussion board.